Thanks so much for this introduction. And as just mentioned, my name is Wojtek. I would like to talk today uh, about the geometry of competitive games and uh, take you kind of on the journey uh, from ranking chess players to building uh, Grandmaster StarCraft II agents. Uh, just a full disclosure, is the first time that I'm gonna try to give this uh, talk. So uh, I hope it won't be too hectic. I think it is quite nice uh, story, but it's something that is really a summary of what I've been working on for multiple years. And it just combines multiple uh, projects that we were uh, working on together. And I just never had the opportunity to make it into one coherent story. I hope you appreciate how this all things seem to be coming together. In terms of, oh, this is actually displayed. This is not great. Um, in terms of what you can see on the slides. From time to time, you actually see uh, me being a big dog fan, uh, having one of these three uh, cute, cute doggos around. So if you see a confused Shiba, this means this is an open question, something I'm just leaving on the slide, even not that I don't have really an answer. And this is something, you know, uh, potentially worth pursuing, something uh, that I would love to know an answer for. Uh, if you see more of an intrigued doggo that to be reading census rather than sciences because apparently Dali cannot spell yet. Uh, this is a paper reference where you can read more about the topic that is on the slide. And if you see the Corgi Doctor, uh, these are take home messages when I was just trying to you know, list down some things that I think are important summaries of what we've gotten so far. And let me start then with a few questions that I think are still open, even though I spent many years also trying to address some of them uh, in the multi agent. Um, uh, learning and in game theory. And my talk will really try to address these three. First of all, how can we rank players in competitive games? Second of all, how can we predict the outcomes? So, you know, given some sort of ranks or representation for each player, how can we tell whether I am going to win against the next player or a player with this specific rank? And then finally, how can we actually train agents to become the best uh, with respect of one of these notions of bestness of, you know, being ranked number one? And let us start by setting up some language. So this whole talk will have a lot of definitions and some math, but this doesn't really require you to go through all of this. I'm gonna to try to keep it relatively high level and I'm just setting it also in a formal way if you would like to revisit the slides afterwards. We're gonna be talking about mostly normal form games. So I'm gonna uh, represent a game or think about the game, um, which is quite, typical in the literature, uh, and I'm going to associate it with a payoff matrix. Okay, so I'm going to assume that we have a collection of all possible policies, all possible ways to play a game. Um, and we have a matrix PIJ, uh, where the I uh, J entry is just the outcome. If player I would player, uh, play against player J, what would be the outcome? Like number of score, like number of points that they are getting. And sometimes it will also be bijectively by mapped on the probability of winning. Right, so sometimes I'm going to say it's P with the uh, line, which is going to be just a probability that player I beats player J. And I'm going to focus on symmetric um, zero sum competitive games, which essentially means if player I wins against player J, this means player J loses against player I. Okay, there is just a full symmetry. The game is 100% competitive. In terms of algebra, if we're in this first representation, this just means that the uh, matrix is equal to minus its own transpose. Or if it's this probability space version, this just means that the matrix is equal to one minus this transpose. Okay, so it is a structured space. These are not all possible uh, matrices, but a very specific part. They are anti-symmetric if you're more um, maybe from algebraic backgrounds. And the first natural question that you know the community has been asking itself for a long time is how can we actually rank players? Like we play games all the time. Some of you surely love to play chess, Go, StarCraft or football or anything. Um, and people have been trying to figure out, okay, can we actually tell that this person is better than the others or it's 13th in the world? And there are many ways, of course, in which one could address this question. In particular, Arpat Ilo, um, quite a while ago, has proposed this very simple model to rank people in chess. And uh, the model simply says each person is gonna have a score, which is gonna be uh, later called Ilo rank. Uh, he represented as F. And when we are going to try to uh, predict uh, what will be the outcome of player I playing against player 
j, we are going to take a difference in between their scores. We are going to push it through sigmoid, and this is going to give us probability of winning. So given the actual empirical payoffs that we observe, because people actually play against each other, uh, you can just do various forms of maximum likelihood estimation of what fi, fj would give you the highest probability of producing these outputs with this simple uh, probabilistic model. Of course, he provided various characteristic methods also to do this online and so on. But on high level, you can think about this as everyone got assigned a number, and then we use a sigma it's squashing to just tell who is going to be winning. It's super simplistic. Uh, it's something that is very naive. Nevertheless, it's used till uh, this day. If you actually are a chess player or are you following uh, chess, you will find that, for example, Magnus uh, Carlsen, currently the best chess player in the world, is sitting at around uh, 2800 ELO. And it's something that is really useful. It is actually useful to assess how good players are. And it is quite good at predicting the actual outcomes. If you take a difference between Magnus, for example, and say Wang Hao, uh, you get like 100 um, ELO difference. So from this equation there, it's like reading out the sigmoid at one over one plus E to one fourth, whatever it is, probably gonna be like 51%. Like these gaps will be relatively small. Yes? I just want to ask one yep. obvious question. In this situation, yep. Um, this is just some form of approximation, right? So first we had P that is the actual underlying thing, that the payoff matrix. And this is the approximation that the ELO provides. We're assuming that this uh, matrix can be represented in this form, but it's a very simple approximation okay. that assumes this very linear uh, progression. So we're approximating sort of, we're approximating the, who would win between two specific players between yeah. given their scores. With like rank one approximation essentially. We're just saying number is enough to represent it instead of full matrix. And as you said, it's a huge oversimplification. Um, and the same applies, say, to StarCraft. If you are a StarCraft player or eSport player, you also have some different um, points that you're gathering. For example, MMR is nothing but ELO or can be seen as ELO, or instead of using sigmoid, you're using cumulative normal distribution. There's really no good reason, apart from the fact that math is much nicer if you go through normal distribution rather than through ELO. And this allows us to also very easily reason about uncertainty. But essentially, once the ranks are converged in StarCraft land, it can be seen literally as ELO just with a different normalizing constant. Before it was divided by 400, now it's divided by four, uh, 567 uh, for some unknown reason. And this is why the StarCraft players have 8,000 MMR rather than 3,000 the chess players have. It's not because they're stronger, they are just dividing by a bigger number. And of course, it can also be applied to AI. And it's something that we have used for a long time, in particular, back when we were working on the uh, Capture the Flag project and we're introducing population-based training. We were using ELO also to rank populations of agents. So we were working on this idea for a long time that in order to be good at multiplayer problems, you actually need to be training population. You cannot be just learning one agent. So we were training multiple agents, and we needed some notion of who is good in this population so we can use evolutionary algorithm to evolve a reward signal to be training against. And back then we did use ELO uh, to actually rank ag agents against themselves. So we would compute the empirical payoff matrix approximated with ELO and use it as an evolutionary signal. And this was enough to actually get very, very strong agents back then uh, human level agents. But as you can imagine, and going back to your question, this is just an approximation. And of course, as any approximation, eventually it will fail. So it's natural to ask, when does it fail? And it can fail in various ways. The first one uh, that I really like, and uh, there were quite a few cool papers about this. David Balduzzi was also very, um, very excited about this topic before, before he decided to be more of a finance person, um, is that um, many problems are actually more cyclic than transitive. So this notion of rank one approximation that there is some set of points really goes back to this idea that skills are transitive, that if I can beat someone at the game and this person can beat another person, then I can beat this last person as well, right? That there is this like logical transitivity. Someone being better uh, means that I'm also better than everyone. This person is better than. Uh, but real world doesn't necessarily look like this. You, definitely played rock, paper, scissor when you're like five or so uh, and realize very quickly that there is no actual winning strategy, right? You just need to be uh, mixing things uniformly. So once the games get uh, cyclic, ELO breaks. And David wrote this very nice uh, statement here that ELO is essentially a uniform average in the logic space or can be seen like this. And its predictive failures are due to the cyclic components 
uh, that uniform averaging ignores. So in the games like rock, paper, scissors, or a famous, well, I'm going to call it famous just because I love David's work, um, this game, which is just a continuous um, generalization of a rock, paper, scissors game where you play on a plane with a very similar uh, notion of rock, paper, scissors beating, but simply you have stronger rocks and stronger papers inside, it looks completely fails, right? And everything just collapses to a single point. That is two cool papers that I can recommend you reading. And maybe this is obvious that once you have cycles, uh, ELO will no longer be useful. What's maybe a bit uh, less obvious is that it can even fail in a very transitive domain. When I say transitive, I mean transitive in the sense that I am better than someone, and then this other person is better than the third person. So let's imagine a game like this that just three players. This is the payoff. So of course, we are drawing against ourselves. And the first player is going to beat second and third with 55% of the 55% uh, chance. And the second is going to beat the third one 80% of the time. So one could argue that the first player is the best. It's actually beating everyone, but simply less reliably than the second person is dominating the third one. And then you can actually show both mathematically and empirically that it will actually fail in the sense that it will say the second player is the best, is the rank one. This is the person who has the most uh, skill in this game. And the uh, subtle problem with ELO is that it assumes way more than this sort of transitive behavior, that there's an ordering and rank one approximation. It assumes that your payoff matrix has additive structure. So the scores, the probabilities can be added in the logarithmic space, which is much stronger assumption and very rarely actually mentioned. People usually say that ELO works when things are transitive. Not exactly. It can fail even there. So there is definitely some need to go beyond ELO if you want to be predicting outcomes correctly, even in relatively simple games or in games that have strong transitive components. And arguably games that we play these days do have these strong transitive components. There are many ways in which you could generalize it. I'm just going to mention two, um, because they actually share a common ancestry. So one is uh, from open-ended learning in symmetric zero-sum games, again, from David's work, where we take the original play of matrix, and then we fit our ELO model that we just talked about. And then we say, we are going to take the residual. So whatever was not explained by ELO, we're going to take the ELO and use it to actually predict the outcomes, subtract it from the original payoff and say, OK, this is left, right? These things were not explained. So let's take these unexplained things, call them A, and then do the sure decomposition uh, of the anti-symmetric matrix, which decomposes it into these smaller or low rank matrices. It's going to be a sum over now rank two matrices. Okay, so we have one dimensional ELO plus K two dimensional games that you're summing over. And something that uh, back then wasn't obvious to us, and uh, we realized literally last year, uh, is that actually there is a more natural way, and you can do this directly from P. You can completely ignore ELO. The reason why we went there in the first place was because ELO is a well-established thing, and you know it measures transitivity, so this is a natural starting point, but you can actually do the short decomposition directly on P and get to the same point, and you will be able to actually show that this decomposition itself captures something very ELO-like. So you don't have to hard code it. It's actually an emergent property in the sense that just exists in a short decomposition itself. Um, the nice thing is, and OK, before I go to the detail, let me just advertise why this actually works or how does it work. So if you now take, uh, say, a collection of real world games, and by real world, I just mean chess, go, and so on, and we just compute the payoffs for them, you can see that as we now keep more and more dimensions in this decomposition, either using the M ELO one, so every second row is M ELO, this path that David proposed originally, or you do the disk decomposition, the lower path, you just get better and better predictive performance. And in terms of purely empirical things, actually the cleaner decomposition, the one that doesn't assume that ELO is you know, a great starting point, uh, is a bit better. It's not a big difference, but on average, it seems to be actually being more predictive of the structure of the game underneath. So why did I call it the disk decomposition? It's because you can actually prove a very cute set of properties. And again, I'm going to refer to Bertrand's paper for, uh, for more math intuitions. But essentially, you can show that in these, um, the, these games from short decomposition, they all look like these games. The ones that we saw on the second slide um, from David's paper that look like rock, paper, scissor. It's just not a full plane, but rather some subset of the points. But the rules of the game are exactly these this games. And you can then show that every single game, every competitive zero-sum game decomposes into some of these games. 
Okay, so every game, no matter what it is, chess, go, football, uh, it will decompose into some of these games. Furthermore, each of these games is going to be either fully transitive or fully cyclic, and at most one is going to be transitive, which is the probably the cutest uh, result from this from this paper. That among all these dimensions that you get naturally from sure decomposition, exactly one is transitive. Sorry, at most one is transitive. The game can be completely cyclic, and then there's, of course, no transitive component. But this means that we don't have to hard code, say, ELO as a transitive one. We can just take the full decomposition and find the one that is transitive. And this property of being transitive has a very easy geometry uh, bijection. If you look at the points on the plane in this decomposition, you take a convex hull. If zero, is inside, uh, inside the convex hull, uh, then the game is cyclic. Otherwise, it's transitive. And you only find one of them that is transitive. So it's just a cleanup, really. right? Something that doesn't necessarily reinvent things is a subtle result, but I think gives us a very nice intuition into what's happening underneath. And we can actually you know, do this now in practice. Say we take chess games and StarCraft games from some human played games. We can take the empirical payoffs. Each column here is just the payoff where we are more and more conservative in saying that the uh, probability of winning is well estimated by requiring more and more matches to be played between pairs of players. Because of course, not everyone plays against everyone in the chess community or in StarCraft community. So you end up with very sparse matrices. And as you get to a higher and higher uh, conservativeness, you get better estimation, but of course you ignore more and more players uh, from the game. And you can see, for example, in chess, that once you go to around 80 matches with points, you get really decent uh, estimation. The convex hull seen on these plots, which is just the first element of our DC decomposition, uh, is the one that is fully transitive because zero here is included in convex hull, it's included here, it's included here, but here zero is completely outside, meaning that this one becomes transitive. So once we remove the noise that comes from this bad estimation, at this point, chess looks very transitive. Meaning, yes? Is that a clay thing to get and then like a very sensitive score? Yes. So we simply only keep the outcome if these two players played 80 games in some period of time. With each other? Yes, only with, with, with each other. Um, and you can do the same with StarCraft. And here, you also reconstruct this sort of behavior that eventually you discover very transitive component, but you need to filter out things way more. You can wave hands and say that this might imply that one game has a stronger transitive component and maybe more non-transitivities. It might be attributed to some extent that one of these games is fully observable and the other is not. And partially observable problems usually will have more you know, degenerated things that you just cannot be prepared for. So just to summarize this one element, Something that I want to um, send as a message in some sense or make a statement is that ELO assumes more than transitivity, something that at least to me was not obvious for a long time. Uh, second, that every game can be decomposed to these like these games. And finally, that these, these games have at most one transitive one. So there's a very natural notion of transitiveness uh, that is out there that doesn't require us to actually assume like a sigmoid based model. Why am I not changing the slide? Here we go. And the natural question um, that is more open now is that um, in the end, these properties hold for any anti-symmetric matrix. And anti-symmetric matrices can represent very complex objects. But the games that we might be interested in because we are in, say, AI research are probably uh, occupy a smaller part of this space. We probably don't want to be able to analyze every single competitive game someone can, can think of because many of them are absolutely crazy. Uh, but rather we want things that are grounded in some challenges that we're interested in as humans, as scientists. So we might ask ourselves, okay, what are the extra properties that games that we actually play have? This anti-symmetry is just every zero sum game. But games are beyond this, right? Games on one hand can be taken as a, you know, object from game theory, and then anything that has a payoff is a game. So you end up with things like this game, which is a bit boring game to actually play, or Colonel Blot on Rock, Paper, Scissors. But then there are games that I think most of us would agree are actual games like Dota, Quake, Go, Tic Tac Toe, Football, and what's not. And arguably, there is some structure on the left-hand side that doesn't have to be shared uh, in all the rest of the space. And figuring out what we can exploit on the left-hand side is one of, I think, very important open questions, both in game theory and in very practical applied game theory. Something that we have been proposing is that there exists something like 
what we call games of skill, which is probably a subset of all these games that we are interested in um, and probably involve some other things where there exists a very strong transitive component. The non-transitivities are still around, but they are simply not the main, uh, say, dimension. So we can think about these, these games uh, and they are ordered by like, essentially eigenvalues uh, in the decomposition. So you can think about these games as those that have the transitive components with relatively early indices uh, of these decompositions. So something that we um, try to formalize um, back in this day, and you can notice that uh, this talk is a bit weird in the sense of time flow. I'm actually starting with the latest results and I'm going back in time. And of course, the research happened in the exact opposite uh, direction. And everything I'm talking about started in the practical problem I'm going to end with. And I'm now going from the opposite land because I think we now got much better understanding of what's happening. And so I'm trying to build it in terms of causality rather than the messy process of research that actually happened. So I hope this is a helpful direction. Nevertheless, we're going one year into the past or two years into the past, and we are asking ourselves, okay, uh, what sort of structure can we expect? And something that we realize when working on StarCraft is that games really uh, allow players to communicate a lot of information. So we define this notion of n-bit communicativeness, which is just how many bits of information players can transmit to each other purely through actions, not for some additional channel, not like chat messages, but actually through acting and observing each other's actions, either being close to each other in partially observable environment or in fully observable environment by just taking actions <laughs> uh, before the outcome of the game is predetermined. So how long we can transmit information before we need to agree who has won because we run out of places to put our stones on a gobble, for example. And a somewhat trivial uh, theorem that you can prove then is that um, if the game is n-bit communicative, this means that there exists a set of two to power n policies that can achieve any sort of win loss uh, payoff that you would design. In particular, it can achieve a fully cyclic payoff, which means that every game that's I... communicative has a cycle in pure strategies of length at least two to power n. Okay, because can I jump in with a question? Practice proof you can tell how the strategy exactly looks like. Um, the nice thing is that if the game is uh, simple, uh, like you can actually traverse the game tree, like in tic-tac-toe case, then you can compute n um, exactly, uh, which is quite nice and is a relatively efficient algorithm. Uh, and if the game is too large, like in case of Go or something like this, uh, you can use the same algorithm and the same theorem to at least provide a lower bound. So you can actually do some simplifications in the algorithm, cut with characteristics uh, and get a lower bound. And you can prove, for example, that for the game of Go, uh, the communicativeness is at least 1,000, which means that in a game of Go, there exists two to power 1,000 pure deterministic strategies of playing the game of Go, uh, such that they form a cycle of length two to power 1,000, right? Which is like orders, orders of magnitude more than atoms in the observable universe or any other reasonable number I can, uh, I can think of. Of course, they're horrible strategies. Don't get me wrong, they don't actually play Go, but they follow the rules and then they form this extremely complex uh, dynamics. So this is what we know exists somewhere, right? So we are imagining that um, in the somewhat abstract geometry of these real games that have this sort of property, there has to be this huge plane of extremely non-transitive um, strategies. And then it is quite reasonable to assume that the uh, game designers didn't require us to remember and figure out that many strategies to be actually good. So once we get high on some notion of performance, say the transit dimension, uh, the Nash itself should be relatively small. And also you can imagine that for every game, uh, there also exists a misery version of this game where you actively try to lose. And there are probably also relatively few ways to be extremely efficient at losing. If you've never tried to play a game where you try to actively lose at tic-tac-toe, I assure you it's quite fun. It will give you like five to 10 minutes of extra fun the same way you had five, 10 minutes when you play, first played tic-tac-toe as a child and didn't know the optimal strategy. You will figure out this one quite quickly as well. So the spinning top hypothesis that we put forward is just a rough interpolation between these two extremes. You can prove that there is this weird non-transitivity in the middle, and then you have the uh, nice uh, simple extremes at the end. So it's reasonable to assume that there is some form of smooth approximation in the end, uh, sorry, in between, uh, but it is a hypothesis. Maybe it's actually super jittery and looks like an extremely spiky ball, like high dimensional balls are very spiky, for example. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, now do two things. One, verify empirically, 
if these things really look like this and maybe more importantly does it actually matter like sure it's nice to know how things look like but it'd also be nice if they are useful for something so let's assume for a second that games have this sort of structure so we have a spinning top and let's further try to split it into layers and i'm just going to split them into layers by saying that uh, strategies belong to a layer if and only if they fully dominate they beat everyone from previous layers every game can be decomposed like this unfortunately for many games it will be just one layer right if there's some sort of more complex relationship nevertheless it's always possible the worst case scenario is it's going to be very degenerate decomposition but it's just a simplifying assumption to start we are going to abandon it soon enough but if things look like this uh then even very simple algorithms that is just fictitious self-play with fixed memory where you have a population of agents and you try to beat everyone and then replace the oldest strategy with this new best response uh will converge to the nash as long as the or to the top of this of this spinning top uh, as long as your population is big enough and big enough just means bigger than the biggest layer that is still above you so if you start at the bottom you need to have more than atoms in the universe not the greatest idea in the world but if you now initialize strong enough by introduction of some priors uh by better strategies by introducing search mean maxing and so on then all you need is big enough population uh, to be here of course you can also improve your algorithm you don't have to do the naive fixed memory fictitious self-play uh, but there's some nice connection here that provides you uh with trade-offs right so you can use a very weak algorithm but then you need to initialize high enough and have big enough population you can make a small population but then initialize even higher or get a better algorithm but of course this assumption is a bit boring and over uh, simplistic so let's replace it with something that actually is more uh, reasonable and something that we um, realized back then is that you can use what we called Nash cluster. So essentially, we are just gonna divide our game by computing the Nash of the game as we normally would. So we have a payoff, we compute the Nash, we take the support of the Nash and are gonna call it cluster one. We are gonna remove corresponding rows and columns from our payoff and we're gonna repeat the process. Eventually, it will of course converge and reduce everything because for zero sum competitive games, there's always a Nash. Um, and of course, we're always cutting at least one. So it is decreasing in size. Eventually, it will disappear. And from the first hypothesis that in good games, in the spinning top like games, these Nashes, at least initially, should be very small. We would also expect that this is not going to be a degenerate decomposition where everything just collapses to one cluster, but rather this cluster is going to be relatively small, a bit bigger, 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 and then smaller and smaller again, if the spinning top hypothesis was true. So we decompose things like this, and then you can show that with the definition uh, of relative population performance back from David's paper, these clusters create a sort of transitive uh, ordering. So they're actually ordered with respect to a specific metric, and this metric is nothing but uh, a value of a Nash equilibrium between strategies from these two clusters. So you have a, your original game uh, with a pay of P, sorry, pay of A. You have one population of agents, so one cluster versus another population of agents with the second cluster. They play infinitely many games until they actually converge to a Nash. And then you say, okay, what's the outcome then? Of course, one of them can be better than the other because it has better players to choose from. And you can prove that as you go through this structure, relative population, relative population performance between cluster one is going to be non-negative with respect to everyone uh, below. Uh, for C2 is going to be better than C3 and C4. So it has this like transitive structure inherent to it. And then you can prove that if you have, again, this super naive algorithm with just beating everyone in your population, then if only your population is diverse enough that it captures fully a Nash cluster and as many other things as you want, but at least a Nash cluster is a subset of your population, then you are guaranteed that your best response is going to jump into a higher cluster. So you're guaranteed to make a transitive improvement by a very naive best response uh, to your fixed size population, as long as it's diverse in this very strictly defined notion of diversity. You know, we've had this argument surely many times in the papers that diversity is all you need, right? And in multi agent, you need to have diversity seeking strategies and whatnot. This is a very strict version of this, right? Diversity is defined literally. You need to capture a Nash cluster and then you're guaranteed to improve. It's not a hand wavy thing. You need different things to be ready for different things. It's an open question though, 
uh, even to be able to tell if you captured the full Nash cluster without actually knowing the old strategy in the game. Because you can notice from the construction, there's a top-down construction. We started with the full game to define the Nash. But if you're actually training your agent and starting from scratch, you never see this full thing. And you don't know if you are actually in the Nash of the full game. You might be Nash in your empirical game, which is a subset of the matrix. So this is an open problem. And as such, it only guided us as the guiding principle for these dining algorithms that in practice worked, but there is a missing link on the theory level if you can actually make it a strict algorithm that guarantees uh, detection of the Nash clusters. It's just something to remember, something uh, that I will be referring to that we will try to capture these Nash clusters in practice. So this is just to visualize this notion I was just talking about that Diversity allows us to improve transitivity. So in every of these situations, so in these three situations, imagine pink orb being our population, as long as the full cluster is covered. So this cluster is covered. Now these are clusters, not the layers from the beginning. Then beating it guarantees us to jump uh, above to the higher Nash cluster, actually improve transitivity. But as soon as we have a tiniest gap in our coverage, then beating it might improve, but it might decrease as well. It depends now on the other factors of how did you find your best response or good response, what sort of biases and priors you've put into your system. So there's at least a guiding principle to look for this full coverage. The second question that I was putting forward is, okay, apart from nice properties, we would like to also see if in real life the spinning top actually emerges, right? So we took a bunch of games, we generated empirical playoff matrices, so we generated a few thousand policies uh, um, deterministic policies for various real world games like tic-tac-toe, tiny, tiny go, like three by three go, not actual full go. Um, computed their empirical payoff matrices. We computed then the Nash clusters, recomputed the payoff matrix with relative population performance to confirm indeed it's transitive, right? We had a theorem, so let's double check that we didn't mess up the math. And indeed we see that everything above the diagonal is white and blue and everything below the diagonal is white and red. And then, you can plot the uh, geometry to some extent when on X axis, we put the size of the Nash cluster which we now associate with how non-transitive this structure is. And on the Y axis, it's called fraction beaten, but it's really just an index uh, of this cluster. So further to, towards the top, the lower the index. So these are the strongest policies, uh, strongest clusters, sorry, at the top. And what you can see in practice is that for various, various games that we tried, you do recover this sort of like spinning top shape. Of course, what spinning top is, is not a well-defined object. All we mean by this is that there is this sort of relatively small notch at the top, relatively small notch at the bottom, extremely wide uh, in the middle, and there's somewhat smooth interpolation in between them. Take this with a grain of salt, of course, because these are empirical payoff matrices. We don't actually have all the strategies of playing these games, because even for tic-tac-toe, there are more strategies than I think atoms in the universe. We have a number somewhere, and there are horrendous amounts. I can uh, get it out if you would like to know, but it's surprisingly large. I can leave it as an exercise to count how many pure strategies are there in tic-tac-toe. Um, interestingly enough, um, if you do this over many games that we found in literature, like this game, Blotto games, uh, or Queen Poker, then the structure is not present there, right? So there are definitely games that don't look like a spinning top. So this is not merely um, an effect of how we sample the strategies or how our analysis is applied, but rather it is something that seems to discriminate between some classes of games, whether it actually captures all the games of interest is not proved by merely 20 samples, but at least gives us some belief that this is indeed happening. So these are not real games. These are games created by mathematicians to study game theory, like Bloto uh, or Kun Poker. Uh, ELO games are just very simple things that we can construct uh, to study ELO. Um, and RPS is just rock, paper, scissors. That, of course, is just a dot here. I don't know why it's in the corner. It should be in the middle. Yes? So, isn't there some sort of underlying reality of, say, balanced games? So, for example, is um, plotting um, a large component of the game that involves this um, sort of like top shape? So, for example, or that there are games with immediate wins, say, for example, like with rock, paper, scissors? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I don't have a specific answer. I think there will be many answers. Like, there's definitely some structure, right? some properties that will imply these things. For example, any game with a give up action uh, is going to have a very small, um, lower 
part of the code, right? Because there are, there's literally just one optimal strategy to lose. I give up in the first move, right? So this is a provable state. But then what other properties are there? It really depends. For example, one question that we're asking ourselves is why on earth is Bloto so crazy? Like always the natural Bloto is very big. And this comes from the fact that Bloto is extremely um, symmetry invariant. Uh, so once you get to bigger and bigger Bloto, you just have for every single strategy, uh, exponentially many equivalent strategies that you have to mix over um, because they are all essentially doing the same thing and the game is completely invariant to the ordering and it's a complete mad thing. Humans can never do this. Humans cannot uniformly sample from complex objects. It's just beyond what our brain seems to be designed to do. Uh, so really, even if you know the strategy of how to play optimally in total, for a human it is extremely hard to pull off because you need to be able to sample uniformly from a set that has, say, million components. It's just Unless you have a computer, of course, in your these days you can take a smartphone, right? And just the random number between zero and one million. But without it, we are a bit too. But yeah, we don't have a general answer. There are definitely some indications. Um, cool. This is just a note that um, as part of other things, I also made a small demo. If you would like to play with it, this is just uh, in JavaScript written a uh, simple simulation where you can load one of these playoffs. I think it's a tic tac toe. Uh, and you can play with where you initialize, how big your population is, and also you can pick how strong your best response algorithm is, how optimistic it is to actually jump above versus below, and see exactly these sort of like trade offs where you're just playing with the sliders and see that bigger population allows you to go up even if you have really weak priors and what's not. So, this is just a small uh, extra thing if you like to play with it. So, few take home messages from this part is that training big populations of agents really became something that driven forward a lot of progress, at least in groups that I was involved in, and something that we really believe is a very natural way forward. Yes, it's expensive in some sense, um, but it simplifies a lot of other access. So it's just one of these things that you have in your toolkit, in your disposal, that you should be aware of. The same way you might be an expert in, you know, best RL algorithms, but if you want to actually you know, succeed and get the best, I don't know, get the best AI to do something, you should be aware of what is your current bottleneck. And your bottleneck is not always going to be your RL algorithm. It might also be something as trivial as size of your population that you might also want to try and do like a scaling plot. If I actually just make it bigger, uh, how things will in, uh, increase. Uh, second bit is that there is a value in investing of processes that cover exploitability. So this is this notion of trying to cover the Nash cluster as much as possible. Um, then training against the whole population to make sure that when you present a new agent to your population, it's actually better than everyone. And considering the strong priors and initialization to make your life easier, to never be you know, below uh, this forbidden land of two to power thousand strategies, because this is a mad, mad place. Now, of course, still many open questions. For example, this whole analysis assumes the normal form. It really collapses everything to a flat land, but real world games are usually in extensive form games. So how does it look like when you actually look at the time dimension? Is it gonna be a collection of spinning tops? Is it gonna be something completely different? We don't know. And this is an open question of what actually happens when you um, yeah, go into extensive form rather than normal form game. So let me jump from this uh, very high level and theoretical aspect to something quite practical. And I hope there's no sound. Yes. Um, sorry, it's quite loud. Um, so I don't know how many of you play things like StarCraft, so just a high level for those who do not. Uh, StarCraft is a real-time strategy game uh, developed pretty much two decades ago. And since then, it has been one of the most popular esports that is in this genre. Um, and is something that is known to be extremely deep in, and complex in terms of the uh, competitive aspects that like people are still discovering completely new ways, new strategies to play StarCraft despite having been competitive scene for yeah, pretty much two decades. A high level idea is you start with some basic units and you need to build your economy, gather resources to uh, build your base, build units, and then eventually remove the base of the opponent from the, uh, from the map. Once opponent loses all the buildings, they lose the game. They don't need to lose the units. So there's like a very well-defined uh, win condition. There, there is like a special rule of drawing, but it happens so rarely that we can just ignore it and just say this game always ends in a win uh, of one side or the other. And it's a challenge, or it was a challenge for a long time uh, in the AI community uh, of can we actually get AIs to um, be relatively good at this game? Uh, to give you some like rough idea, there are, for example, built-in AIs in the game itself, and they are more or less in a golden league, um, which is probably bottom 
20% of the players, maybe low, uh, lower. It's something that you can beat after probably an hour uh, with a game. And people have attributed it to many things, right? The game is very complex, it involves um, strategizing, thinking, like planning in terms of economy, execution, but also economy of attention. There are many aspects that make it an extremely challenging thing. And um, the paper I'm now going to be covering on a very high level, the Grandmaster level in StarCraft II using multi reinforcement learning uh, has been a huge effort by a huge number of people. So um, I'm putting here like various elements uh, of the project uh, just to make sure that it's clear that what I'm going to be talking about is a tiny fraction of the whole thing is really an effort, you know, by dozens of people like paper itself has 42 authors. Um, even more people like transitively involved in, in its development. It was about architecture design, it was about supervised learning, reinforcement learning, multi-agent learning, and eventually it allowed us to actually build agents at our grandmaster level. So they'll say in like pro week level. Uh, we even had an opportunity to play against Cyril here in upper right corner, the best uh, player in the world, arguably. Um, and under non-tournament condition in like friendly matches that we played against him, uh, we compared favorably. This is not to say that we are anywhere near Cyril in overall skills, but just to say that the agent is definitely uh, in like overall pro uh, or grandmaster level, uh, even when played against really the best, uh, best players in the world. So the idea or the part I want to cover is really the part of the multi-agent, right? And in Starka, for example, you can we really identify these sort of non-transitivities, non-transitive structures that are inherent to the spinning top hypothesis and also to some problems with other training methods. Uh, in particular, there are specific units that have literally rock, paper, scissor-like dynamics. If you are familiar with Starcraft, we can think about, for example, Protoss units. There's a void ray that's like a flying unit, and there are some units that don't shoot up. Ergo, it is very good at something that doesn't shoot back, right? So it can uh, defend armies based on immortals. Immortals can defend uh, stalkers, and stalkers can overwhelm uh, voyagers. So they create this nice cyclic behavior. If you were to go in this very simplistic world where all you're doing is start companies by one unit, which of course you usually do not, it's much more complex. But what happens when you actually train with self-play like dynamics, at least what we've observed when you actually train StarCraft agents in self-play like dynamics, is that you start with quite a uniform mixture of units, and then agents relatively quickly specialize. Oh, I just need a uh, void race. And then when you try to beat yourself, the agent already knows very well how to build voyages, and it took it thousands of you know, actions to get to this technology, so it just invest in more void rays, right? And of course, more units usually beats less units. So you get in this super over-specialized regime. If you had some sort of extra diversity introducing motivation, like an exploiter, an agent that's only goal is to show you you are doing this wrong. There are very easy ways to beat you. Ergo, there is a very easy way for me to belong to a Nash with you, right? Because if I can beat you, even if you beat everyone else, as long as I can beat you and ignore everyone else, we are going to be together in the Nash, quite like, right? Clearly, you cannot be in the Nash, and I am not going to be there if I can beat you. Uh, and no one else can. So you can introduce an exploiter, and then what happens on a high level often is that it will uh, find that, oh, there's a counter to your strategy. I just be, uh, create a few stalkers. And even if I execute it badly, just because of the strong non-transitive dynamics of the game, I'm going to win. Ergo, when you are going to keep training and try to be yourself or previous versions of yourself and also beat my new composition, you are going to start being more robust. You are going to invest in this third missing dimension. So I'm playing a lot of papers. So you're going to start mixing scissors so that you are not exploitable uh, by plays like my own. And the practical incarnation that we went for was essentially to think about our population as an ever-growing set of strategies. And we have three processes that uh, add new strategies into this set. The main agent is the one that really is going to be the outcome of the algorithm. Its goal is to look at itself, play in self-play mode, and also look at everything that is in the population and beat everyone uniformly. Okay, sorry, not uniformly, but in infinite sense. It wants to beat every single one, not an average, but every single one. Then there are two processes that try to expand the coverage of Nash clusters in this population. First one, main exploiters, whose only life goal is to look at these main agents and find the uh, exploits. So they just try to beat these guys without caring about population at all. And they do this without providing learning signal for the main agents. So the main agents don't see exploiters, exploiters play against them until they find an exploit, and then they just put it into the population. And then the main agents become aware, oh, well, I need to beat this one as well, because I have very low win rate. And then there is also 
big exploiters that are just looking at the whole population and try to beat it uh, in a frozen state, ignoring what the main agents are currently doing. So these are just trying to make sure that the league itself also doesn't have exploits on like a higher level rather than a very specialized one to capture even more notions of diversity. What you can then see in practice happening is really quite remarkable because it almost, uh, at least for a naive person like myself, I'm not a great StarCraft player. I understand StarCraft, but I'm horrible at it. Um, and Agent actually goes for a similar storyline that I would or I went through when I started playing the game. So you start. And you think like, oh, I'm just going to do like the basic units. And then someone comes and builds cannons in your own base. They are supposed to be defensive buildings, but you can also build them in opponent's base and then win the game in like two minutes. So I'm still reading descriptions of my units and I already am losing the entire base. So it's called cannon rush. It's a very nasty strategy. And the agent is exposed to this because of the exploiter and the exploiter succeeds. So agent then gets this checkpoint and plays against it and learns that, oh, if I see the pylon, this power source here, this means the uh, cannon on rush is coming. Ergo, I'm just going to buy very cheap units to make sure that this is not going to happen, and it defends. When it now plays against its own version, it doesn't go into this degenerate strategy, but now it realizes, oh, this is not an exploiter. It's actually a normal player, so it just overwhelms it on better economy, right? So it actually made a decision where to go. But of course, the uh, story uh, continues. And now the exploiter says, OK, you know how to deal with cannon rush. How about invisible units? So it rushes Dark Templar, so units that cannot be seen, attacked, or done anything unless you have a specific detector unit. And of course, it wins, because the agent has no idea what detection even is. Um, and the story continues. And it just keeps finding these strategies. It, it, the funny thing is they really find the strategies that humans are uh, at least initially uh, uh, finding. And of course, after months of play, uh, they find exploits that are ridiculous, like no human would ever uh, play like this. And we showed this uh, to, to TLO, so one of the pro players here is also like, no, like whatever you're playing here, this is not StarCraft anymore. But agents were getting stronger. So whatever they were covering in their own battle net, in their own league, made sense for them. And they were getting stronger. And what does it mean they were getting stronger? Well, you can evaluate it in many ways. And this is also an open question of how to really evaluate these things. Nevertheless, one way was to, OK, first, let's take a look at the training event. So we look at all our population and just measure how well we do against everything that we've created so far. And the nice thing is, OK, we see overall ELO goes up. So a units test. It shouldn't go down, right? It should be improving. It can be an overly optimistic estimate, of course, because we only compare our against things that we've created. And the nice thing is also to see that main agents on average are stronger than leak exploiters and stronger than main exploiters. So again, just the unit tests, you know, things that we can tick that are reasonable. And something that is quite nice to see is also that the main exploiters on average, maybe it's not very strongly seen here, but on average, they're getting actually lower. Like they're getting weaker and weaker over time, and it takes us more and more efforts to find them. So it kind of implies that agents either become non-exploitable or just much harder to exploit under the regime of exploitation that we have, which is, you know, being robust. Of course, you can do some other things. For example, we took some agents that we held completely outside of all the training regime. We hard-coded them to follow very specific strategies that people would execute. And these are like very specialistic agents, like good cannon rush agent or agent that goes for these invisible units very, very quickly and is optimized only to do this and tracked how robust to these strategies you get as you train. And you can also see that the agents are indeed getting this sort of uh, zero shot generalization, right? They never actually train again these strategies and they are very specialistic and you get more and more robust uh, towards the end of training. I mean, there's no real end, it's an open ended learning system, but towards what we call the final spot after around uh, 45 days uh, of training, it's still not perfect, but at least it's getting more and more robust. You can also try to uh, formulate this uh, in terms of where is it coming from, right? So we ablated also existence of exploiters, to make some sort of, con uh, not conditional, but um, credit assignment. Well, what is actually responsible for these changes? And you can see that if you, for example, only train main agents, your final test yield is around 1,500. If you add main exploiters, it's 1,600. Leak exploiters, 1,800. These gaps exist, but they're relatively small. As discussed at the very beginning, 100 ELO difference is like difference between chess player number one and chess player number 15. They are, both pretty good. So you could say, well, this is not an interesting gap. Like, why are you obsessing so much about this small improvement? But then this is really an estimation with respect to this small set of players. If you actually look at relative population performance, so what would happen if it was an actual human who knows about these strategies and after one game against us can just adapt? So again, I'm just going to do it again. 
um, then the relative population performance captures it better. And then you can see that the actual gap is between 6% versus 30, 5% and 62% uh, in terms of performance, when it would be a repeated trial where both players can actually um, just pick which of the test strategies they are after. It's more like a minimum of our possibilities. And finally, you can construct the full payoff, and you can see that there is a lot of madness, at least in this view. Uh, there are main agents versus main agents, which are pretty transitive because they actually trend against each other. There are exploiters that create these more wild interactions, especially between each other, because they never play against each other. So you can redo the spinning top analysis as well, do the Nash clustering again, transitive. We didn't mess up the math, that's good. And see that there is also a spinning lob, uh, top like structure inside. This does not necessarily you know, say that the hypothesis and the methods that we uh, developed for this are true, but just again, bring a higher confidence that this was uh, the right way to go. And for us, this is where it started. We were actually literally looking at these plots and we're asking ourselves, why? Like, why are these things looking this way? And we were just adding exposures and getting cyclic behaviors. How can we deal with this, right? So for us, this is where it started. Then we went to the spinning top papers or spinning top uh, analysis. This uh, motivated us to do the league-based training. Before this, we were just doing self-play. Uh, from this, we're also jumping to the evaluation uh, regime. We talked about the relative population performance. This brought us back uh, to a better spinning top version and a better algorithm. So it's very back and forth story. And the take-home message from here is that something that I learned, I think, also way too late in my PhD and after PhD, that theory often follows and not proceeds. Practice is very convenient and something that we're often biased towards to actually start by saying, I'm going to build this brilliant mathematical model of how things work without actually observing all these things um, first. And then I'm going to check if I was right. Uh, while the way that at least worked much better for me, and I'm going to leave it out there for you to see if this works for you as well, is to start with practice to actually try to focus on a specific real problem that you actually care about and build the mathematical and theoretical understanding if you actually have these open questions that are necessary to make progress rather than create a theory for, for itself. And of course, there are also still many, many open questions in game theory, even though the field might seem quite saturated, especially if we look at the specialized classes of problems rather than say we analyze zero sum games, uh, we look at smaller subsets they are really structured or they seem to be very structured. And finally, StarCraft is amazing. Honestly, give it a try, it's free. Um, and yeah, add me on Battle.net if you're on the play. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be the last slide and just an invite into what comes next. Like what actually lies beyond the games? Because I started with like game theory, so maybe a wider notion of games, but then we ended up in game, video game industry again. Uh, but these things are very much not limited to games themselves. These are just types of competitive interactions and competition exists everywhere. Uh, it exists in open-ended learning systems. There are various papers doing this. This is just the one from our lab. Um, they're also very prominent in game design itself. So, you know, there is game playing AI that I was after, but there's also designing of games themselves that actually has a huge uh, opportunity to, to be uh, here grasped with respect to ever growing sets of challenges, levels, worlds, NPCs, storylines, and so on. And something that I'm personally maybe most excited about is that um, real life sciences actually have a lot of potential uh, to, to be exploited when it comes to competitive interaction, especially when it comes to things like mathematics, chemistry, where you can post many of the problems that we're after, like finding uh, you know, proofs of theorems as competitive problems with, uh, between problem setters and problem solvers, uh, or environment creators and environment solvers. I can imagine in uh, physics, in chemistry, in drug discovery, agents actually creating environments, creating problems and playing a competitive game against someone who is actually now trying to solve it. You can imagine, I don't know, AlphaFold becoming a game where you are actually um, are trying to fold specific proteins and I'm gonna uh, be a player who tries to uh, make your task as hard as possible to create harder and harder task to fold. Um, under the assumption, of course, that I know what default structure looks like. Uh, the same is true in math. You can uh, prove theorems and have a second player actually putting forward open problems uh, to be proven under some notion of their usefulness. Many, many open and exciting things that I think we can tackle as a um, society. So that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. I, again, want to say that this was the first time I was doing this whole joint talk. I hope it was understandable to some extent. 
if not, uh, feel free to reach out and I will try to make better job next time and also explain all the uh, questions by email, website, Twitter handle, uh, or feel free to just talk in person here. Thank you.